Hi, I'm Betsy Urbance, Illinois Realtors Chief Legal Counsel. Joining me today for the last session or episode six, Catch All Miscellaneous, so I know you're dying to know what's in here, will be Annalise Fierstos, Illinois Realtors Legal Hotline Attorney. With regard to some of the provisions that haven't been covered in great detail in any of the prior episodes, there are some that we just want to bring to your attention, either in the revised Real Estate License Act or RELA and or in proposed rules. One item that is sort of conspicuous by its absence from the defined terms under the amended RELA is the term ministerial acts. Ministerial acts was a defined term that in essence said that if you were treating someone as a customer and not a client, you would owe a duty of honesty but not confidentiality to the customer. This remains. You as an agent could still represent one side of a transaction and treat the opposing party as a customer. When you do that, you would give a notice of no agency to the customer. But under prior iterations of the act, ministerial acts was becoming what some believed was some sort of non-agency capacity, and really it was nothing more than a definition of clerical or unlicensed type of activities that you could perform on behalf of a customer when you as a licensee represented the other side. There was even at one time a notice of ministerial acts. What we found to be the case out in practice is that the agent was giving a notice of ministerial acts to both sides of a transaction and did not represent one party or the other as a client. In essence, trying to create a no agency capacity or status, which under the Illinois Real Estate License Act, there really is no such thing. Some other state licensing acts do have non-agency capacities that are called facilitators or transactional agents. Such is not the case in Illinois. So in Illinois, if you are working with someone, you will be presumed to be that person's designated agent to whom you will owe your fiduciary-like statutory duties, all those duties of an agent to a client set forth in Article 15 of the License Act. That's a long way of giving you an explanation as to why ministerial acts is gone. This does not mean that you can't perform ministerial or clerical type activities for a customer and treat that person as a customer when you represent the other side of the transaction and the person whom you're treating as a customer doesn't want representation by means of another agent or doesn't consent to disclosed dual agency which would limit the agent's role substantially in what the agent could do for both sides. So that's a pretty detailed explanation as to why the definition or defined term for ministerial acts went away. Also worthy of note is the global change, it's been mentioned in prior episodes, of leasing agents to residential leasing agents. This was an initiative of the department wanting to make it very, very clear that a leasing agent is a limited license for purposes of only residential brokerage activities. Finally, there are some new continuing education categories. Those are transaction management, broker supervision, which has always been a big deal, but it's very specifically set forth in the statute now, especially with regard to designated managing brokers duties when they're overseeing a new broker licensee who has not yet passed the 45 hours or the three 15 hour post license modules. Also use of technology is another subject matter that's been added to approved continuing education subjects. And finally, professional conduct. 
has been added as an acceptable category for continuing education. Another change that it's important that you are aware of and is among these catch-all provisions is the change to section 10-20E. This has always been there. This is the provision that allows a, a licensee to set up a business entity solely for the purposes of receiving compensation from the sponsoring broker. Now, the changes allow for that entity to be owned by two licensees who are working for the same sponsoring broker. Or, in some cases, if you are a licensee and you would like your spouse to also be part ownership, part owner of that LLC or other business entity, they can also be an owner of the entity that is receiving the compensation from the sponsoring broker. Now, it's important to remember that these licensed entities are not a substitute for a team. This entity is formed solely for the purposes of receiving the compensation. This is an exception to the rule that all compensation flows from the sponsoring broker directly to the licensee. Now, as Annalise just told you about the revisions to section 10-20 subparagraph E, which allows the sponsoring broker to pay the used to be sole shareholder entity, now in very limited certain circumstances, you could have two owners if their spouse is sponsored by the same license bro or sponsoring broker, or so they're both licensed, sponsored by the same broker, or spouse, one spouse is licensed, the other one's not, you could have two owners in that corp or entity that receives the compensation. There was also a rule regarding the, this particular exception to the general rule that payment flows from sponsoring broker to the licensee, and that rule was 1450.745. It still is that section, but it's been renamed. It used to be called the Corporation for Indirect Payment or some such thing, which didn't really make a whole lot of sense because the, the entity is being formed to be a direct source of payment from the sponsoring broker to this entity. So the title is changed from Business Entity for Direct Payment of Compensation. The title is changed to, excuse me business entity for direct payment of compensation. It contains the language that Annalise told you about in the statutory provision. It also makes it clear that this entity itself is not to be licensed, and this is so that you can stay in compliance with section 10-20A, which says if you're a licensee, you can only be sponsored by and work for one sponsoring broker at any one time. So it stands to reason if you try to license that entity, you got to pick who's your sponsoring broker going to be. This entity cannot perform licensed activities and it cannot sponsor or employ other licensees, although that entity could employ unlicensed people. And the reason it could do this is because unlicensed people aren't really covered by the provisions of the License Act other than unlicensed assistance, what I'm going to tell you a little bit about in a minute. And it cannot hold itself out to the public under the entity's name. However, there is a provision in the proposed rules that said the entity could receive other compensation arising out of activities that aren't real estate licensed activities. So I use the example of a window company. You could have your entity that owns a window company, sales or service, I suppose, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with real estate brokerage, but that entity could receive compensation from your window company sales as well as your real estate licensed activities. Information regarding that entity does need to be on file with the department and the division of real estate. With regard to CE, kind of a miscellaneous, wrap it all up type uh, point to make, is that the continuing education is very much required. You still have to do your certain number of hours every two year renewal cycle, depending on what type of license you hold. You'll have to do eight hours if you're a residential leasing agent. 12 hours if you're a broker that's been licensed for more than two years, 
we've talked at length about what the post license requirement is if you're a new broker. And if you're a managing broker, you'll owe 12 hours of regular CE plus the 12 hours of broker management CE to renew your managing broker license. But the deal with CE in general is rather than be a punishable disciplinary offense, unless you're a really bad scofflaw about not doing your CE at all or flat lying about your CE and not doing it, it will be a finable offense as opposed to a disciplinary matter. So you'll be able to get it done, get it done late, pay your fees, and be back in action without being subject to severe discipline at the department. For more on the citation program and CE, go to episode three on training and education. There's a little commercial for you. One thing we do need to discuss before we wind this whole series up is unlicensed personal assistance. Granted, just a few sentences ago, I said unlicensed people aren't really governed by the License Act. Well, they're not until they're an unlicensed person performing licensed activities. So there is a rule talking about unlicensed personal assistance and what they can and can't do. I would advise you to go review that rule. You'll be able to find it at 1450.740 if the rule numbers stay the same when and if rules become final at some point. We're thinking somewhere around June 2020. But the gist of the unlicensed personal assistant rule is that there's a list of items that you could, that you could do as a personal assistant and all of those items or activities that you can do without a license sort of come under the oversight of a licensee. So you wouldn't be placed in a position where you are alone with a member of the consuming public because then when they ask you questions, you're around real estate people, so you'd be sort of, the, the concern is that you would be sort of incentivized or encouraged to give answers that would otherwise require a certain level of education and or the real estate license. So there's a list of things you can do with oversight that don't put you in contact with the general public, but you can do them under the auspices of your sponsoring broker and the licensee that you're assisting or the licensees that you're assisting. There's also a list of things that you clearly cannot do. And this list includes hosting open houses, makes sense, the public's walking in, showing properties, clearly you need a license to do that, interpreting information regarding the real estate or the transaction, explaining or interpreting contracts, Brokers in certain instances shouldn't be interpreting contracts. That's, that's in the purview of the lawyer. But you know what we mean here as far as licensed activities. Or negotiating commissions of any kind. All of these activities would be forbidden to be done by an unlicensed personal assistant. The final note is the addition of a provision that deals with a person's criminal history. These provisions were added to licensing laws across the board for all licensed professions under IDFPR, and I would venture to say under other provisions as well. They have to do with employment or not employing or not affiliating with a person who might have a criminal history. The definition of criminal history would include non-reportable items. In other words, if you are a person who has any of these non-reportable items, you could not be a license, you could not be denied a license because you have these in your criminal history. They would be juvenile records, can't be used against you if in a consideration as to whether to allow you to associate with a brokerage firm arrests with no convictions, or expungements. Expungements, there's a whole bunch of legal terms, but suffice to say, expungements, I think, gives you the idea 
This is a conviction that's been erased from your record. So that should not harm you in your application process to become a licensee or to be sponsored by a sponsoring broker. So the bottom line is you can't be denied a license or sponsorship, which is also other laws that apply on this basis if you have any of these items in your criminal history. There is, however, and continues to be a reporting requirement that if you are convicted of a crime during the term of your licensure, you have a very specific duty to report that to the department. And then the department will consider what, if any, uh, discipline or action will be taken or not taken. This has been the Illinois Realtors RELA web series update. We hope this series has been helpful for you and your business. Remember, you can go back and watch any episode at any time if you need a refresher on the topics we covered. Thank you for joining us.